coming up on today's version of the Art Marketing Podcast, we're going to be talking about getting ready for the fourth quarter buying season. Specifically, we're talking about cold audience targeting on Facebook and Instagram, about how to create an LTV audience, and some of the use cases with LTV audiences that you've probably never thought of. Hey guys, thanks for joining me. Patrick here today. Now let's talk about what is the number one question we seem to get about Facebook ads, right? Like our, our, we onboard our customers, we get them into the system and we immediately encourage them to get all set up on Facebook and to start running ads. And the first question um, out, of, out, of, out of their mouths for the majority of the time, I would say, at least for our customers anyway, the question that always seems to come up first is what cold traffic i.e. when I say cold traffic, new people that have never heard from you or seen you, um, should I be targeting, right? Um, how should I go about it going after people that have never never heard about me, never seen me, cold traffic? And it's a great question too, right? Because it stands to reason if you're attempting to sell your photography or art, finding some new eyeballs to get in front of, likely a good idea. And so I have uh, some great news for you there as we're going to cover this today and then really make some some strong recommendations. And so if you're already experienced with Facebook ads, I think you're really going to enjoy the LTV audience creation piece. If you're just getting started, I think I think you'll enjoy the primer on cold traffic and targeting. And if you've never run an ad before, um, I think I think I'm really going to attempt to break things down conceptually for you uh, here, and uh, you know, uh, in the hopes that when you do get ready to run Facebook or Instagram ads. Not only are you going to have a better understanding of how to go about that, uh, but you're also going to do some of the prep work that's going to set you up for success. Uh, and so that's kind of my thought process on where this will all go. Now, this episode is really, it's a follow-up, a continuation of last week's episode, uh, which we entitled the fourth quarter marketing uh, audit. And so I think if, you, if you've not heard that one, it might be a good idea to stop this one right now, go back, listen to that one, then come back here. Uh, but you know, if you just listen to this one, it'll, it'll still be good standalone. So to briefly sum things up, we're focusing the podcast over kind of the coming weeks on getting ready to sell for the fourth quarter. The buying season is coming. More art is traditionally sold in the fourth quarter than the other three, sometimes combined. So you want to set yourself up for success and you want to sell more art this fourth quarter, more art, more photography this fourth quarter than you have ever before. That's our goal. So today's episode is going to focus on how you go about creating an LTV. By LTV, I mean lifetime value audience. So what that is, how you go about creating it, some of the ramifications, some of the conceptual, we're gonna cover all of that. And obviously this would be an audience you can use both this fourth quarter as well as all year long when you're running ads on Facebook and Instagram. Now, all of which I endeavor to explain, but gotta set the table uh, first. So permit me if you will to kind of give some background. Um, number one, uh, and I, you know, maybe maybe going into a slight slight humble rag here, but why should you listen to me on this subject? Who the heck am I? What do I know? And I actually did an audit on this because I was really curious. And so I went back and looked, and the first ad I ever ran on Facebook was going all the way back to 2010. So I've actually been doing this for eight years now, um, which is which is a long time actually. And I actually went back, looked at all the accounts I've had under management during my career so far, and was sort of blown away to see that I've actually managed well over $1 million uh, doing my Dr. Evil thing with the finger. Now, granted, look, I have friends that spend a, a million a month, so in the grand scheme of things, that's not a big number, uh, especially stretched over the eight years, but I was actually sort of parts blown away by it and proud of it, strangely, the fact that I've gotten over that mark, but anyway. Regardless of where it ranks in the pecking order, I should hope it gives me at least enough street cred uh, to delve in today's subject material um, and for you to know that, 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 it's, that it's valuable and it can help you out. And so I think knowing how long I've been doing this, how much money I've managed in, in, in Facebook ads, you know, a great question that I'm openly asking myself is what is the one thing that you've learned over those years um, and all of that spend? Uh, that sticks out the most to you, that's the most profound. And what I would say, how I would answer that is what I both learned and continue to learn on a daily basis, on a daily basis. and yes, have the scars to show for it, plus, plus the fresh wounds uh, that, that continue to happen. Um, what I see every time we persuade our customers to dive into Facebook and Instagram for the first time after they go after cold traffic, uh, what I don't feel like is discussed or mentioned anywhere near enough when discussing Facebook ads and cold traffic I, I think is actually the secret to success with Facebook and Instagram ads. Now, are you ready for this? 
um, whether or not you're going to be successful running ads on Facebook and Instagram, it obviously comes down to a whole bunch of things, right? Yes, it comes down to your targeting. Yes, it comes down to your creative. Yes, it comes down to your website where you're driving the traffic. Yes, it comes down to your lead capture abilities that you have on the site. Are you, are you effectively gathering emails? And then, of course, it comes down to your follow-up marketing, right? Um, there's lots of lots of things that contribute along the way to whether or not you get a really good ROI out of your ads. But if I had to pick one thing and only one thing that is the most important that I could have absolute mastery of, uh, that I would be the best at, that I could use the magic wand and wave and, and it would be so, it's eliminating the waste. Yep, eliminating the waste. It's eliminating showing your ads to people that are not a good fit. That in my estimation really is the whole ball of wax. That's the most important part. You get that bit sorted and then everything else is downhill. Um, you can you can you can sort out your creative. You can sort out what landing pages that you drive them to. Uh, you can you can sort out your follow up marketing. All of those things. But if you've got a ton of waste in there, you're 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 going to be paying Zuckerberg a whole lot of money. So, I think that's the biggest thing. It's eliminating the waste. And so, okay, Patrick, great, I get it. So, how do we go about doing that? And so, I want to start briefly with some options. And again, we're talking specifically about cold traffic here, at least for now. Getting your photography and art in front of people for the first time, of people that have never heard of you, never been exposed to your art, never visited your website, don't know you exist, et cetera. So let's, let's talk about the options that we have available to us. And for an example, let's say you're, uh, you're a landscape photographer, right? So number one, you could attempt to do what is called interest targeting, i.e. show my ads to people on Facebook and Instagram that have expressed an interest in landscape photography. So you go into the Facebook Ads Manager and you search for what they have available and you find some options that have expressed that interest uh, that are interested in that subject, right? So that's a way you can go. Uh, for number two, let's say you could also target people that like certain pages. And so not every page is available. If they have low follower counts, you can't do this. And it's sort of hit or miss on, on what's available in Facebook, what Facebook lets you do. But let's say with a landscape photographer example, Go ahead and show my work to people that like Ansel Adams' page. And so that's a way you could go about doing it. You could, you could show your ads just to the people that are on Facebook that have liked that page. So that's a way you can go. And let's say to keep things really simple, the number three way that you could go about using uh, a targeting cold traffic on Facebook is, is what are called lookalike audiences, okay? Now, yes, there's some others, like you know, there's demographic data, show my ads to people with a household income of this or that. Uh, as well as you can target people with certain job titles and some other stuff in there, uh, but those are those are those are all the topic of a different discussion. So for now, and for the for the purposes of this podcast, let's just say there's the three ways, right? So we're on number three, the lookalike audiences. So let me define them. This is this is a two step process. Step one, you grab an audience that you have created, and again, there's a whole bunch of options here. It could be an audience of people that have visited your Facebook page, or an audience of people whose emails you have and that you've uploaded to Facebook. Or it could be people that have engaged with your page, i.e. people that have left a comment, that have liked, that have shared. Uh, that can be an audience. Uh, it could be an, an audience of people that have watched one of your videos or even watched 25% of your videos or 50% of your videos. Um, so there's, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can create the base level audience. And, and the one that most people do is that they target people that have purchased something from their website. You create an audience of those folks. Um, and, and, and that serves as the base, that's step one. So you have to pick an audience that serves as step one, right? Step two, you grab that audience and you tell Facebook, hey, Facebook, use your algorithmic powers in sorcery and take this audience and then go find me everyone out there that you can that looks just like these people. And so for the rest of my explanation here in the short term, let's use the example that most people use, right? And that's if people have purchased on your site, right? Um, and, and quickly to explain how this works, if, if you're new, you start a Facebook ads account or, 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 or yeah, it's just a Facebook ads account, but Facebook and Instagram, they're, they're, they're combined. Um, when you do that, you get what's called the Facebook pixel. It's just a line of code. You go and you place this on your site and you set up a conversion. And so what happens is I come to your website, I purchase a piece of art. After I've purchased that piece of art, uh, after I've given my credit card details and the shipping and everything's worked out, I get on a checkout success page, right? And, and a goal page. And on that page, the Facebook pixel fires and Facebook says, oh, okay, 
here's Patrick. I know who he is. I know who his profile. I know his Facebook page. I know his, his user ID, all that stuff. And I know he just purchased. So I'm going to go ahead and place him into this audience, which is probably the, why, by the way, that you want to get this doggone Facebook pixel on your site immediately if you have an e-commerce enabled site. So um, more on that. If you don't, that's okay too. We'll get on that in a second. But that is, that is what most people do, right? They create an audience of people that have purchased. And then over time, as people continue to purchase from you, they, they fill this audience up, right? It's, it's been said that Facebook has essentially over 180,000 data points per person on each and every one of us. Scary, a little bit, yes. Um, but the, the, a data set that big is just so striking and profound that there's no set of human eyes or any team of humans could possibly parse on their own. We couldn't look at those 180,000 data points and say, all right, let's get in here as a team, start analyzing this and, and, and try to pick out the trends, right? There would just be so much data in there. You, you could never do that. So Facebook's algorithm sifts through this massive data set. It grabs all of these random characteristics of people that have purchased on your site and it determines what, if anything, do these folks all have in common? It's like, do they like the same sports or the same pages or the same movies or food? Are they the same age, socioeconomic status? Do they shop at Whole Foods? Are they single, married, gay, straight, have kids, et cetera, et cetera? So that's what happens. All of these people come and they purchase at your site. There's all of these hidden data points that we never get to see that, that tie these people together and it forms a profile, right? So you give that to Facebook. And what they do is they go ahead and they say, okay, here is what ties all these people together. The magic algorithm does this. And then you use that, and here comes the air quotes, to create a look-alike audience. Facebook, go and create me an audience of people that look just like these people that purchased on my site, right? So you pick an initial data source and you tell Facebook to create a look-alike audience, and then you go ask Facebook to show your ads to this people. And this is, this is a third way uh, that you can go after cold traffic, right? So we talked about the interest targeting. We talked about uh, targeting friends of a certain page, people that like a certain page, and then and then our third example, the lookalike audience to keep things simple. So, okay, you've got that. You're tracking with me. Let's contrast these options. Let me give some concrete wor real world examples too, so it uh, you know makes sense. And and let's of course keep in mind. What we now know is the whole ball of wax argument, my argument, which is eliminating the waste, your ads to the wrong people is, is the secret sauce of this entire operation. So in either of examples number one or number two above, and let's just say that is you know our interest targeting and our people that like the page, um, by targeting those examples of cold traffic, what are you going to end up with? You're going to end up with a really wide swatch of the world. You're going to end up with a huge mixed bag of people. Um, you ever see Napoleon Dynamite? I like this analogy. So in Napoleon Dynamite, Uncle Rico and Kip, Napoleon's brother, they're, they're selling Tupperware, right? And, he, and they're sitting down looking at this map and they're kind of like, okay, and they're doing it door to door in their cars, right? And they're looking at this map and they're like, okay. You're going to go up and do this area. I'm going to go work this area. And then Uncle Rico goes on the map and said, don't go down here. And he's pointing to like the poor part of town, right? Because these folks don't have any money. And they don't even bother. Don't waste your time going there, right? And that analogy, I think, works for Facebook ads. When you think about people that like a certain page or are captured in a particular interest, landscape photography from our earlier example, uh, there's going to be a huge mix bag of folks, rich, poor, Everything in between, ready to buy, not ready to buy, uh, uh, such a mixed bag. Some people just like landscape photography because they're landscape photographers. They're not going to buy anything to you. Some people just like photography in general. Uh, there's just a huge swatch. Of, you know, It'd be like taking everybody out of a concert or something. It's like there's going to be such a range of different people in there. And so when you think about showing ads to those people, what's going to end up happening is there's going to be a ton of wasted ad spend. Your ads are going to go in front of these people. Uh, that never are going to buy, that are likely never going to follow you. There's just going to be a lot of waste, right? And I think I see so many times where it's like this common refrain uh, where somebody posts in the group, yeah, you know, I, I took your guys' advice. I, I, they didn't. I tried, to, I, I tried to get into the ads manager and show some ads and some interest targeting, and I spent 150 bucks, and I only got two email subscribers. Well, of course, you picked the wrong targeting, and there was just a tremendous, tremendous amount of waste in there, right? So... As a disclaimer, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that you can't target interest or fans of, and that doesn't work in certain circumstances. It certainly does. It works fantastic in some circumstances. And also, when you're just getting started, you don't have a large data set yourself, it's a chicken and the egg situation, um, it can be valuable to leverage those audiences. But that's, that's the subject of another podcast. So for now, 
let me move into example number three. And of course, I've got to give another analogy. And I love going to fishing. I don't know why it just seems to work in my mind. Apologies if you hate the fishing analogies. But let's stick with it. So let's say, okay, three boats, right? We got three boats. And let's say there's the interest targeting, there's fans of such and such page, Ansel Adams from our above example, and then we've got our, our lookalike audience. So those are all three boats in the same harbor. All three boats are fishing for salmon, okay? In the interest targeting and fans of page targeting boats, you're essentially gonna go tell the captain, captain, okay, here are the GPS coordinates of where I want you to fish. I want you to motor the boat out there to that fishing ground, stay on top of it and fish. Catch as much salmon as you can. Uh, they're going to be big salmon and small salmon at that location. Uh, some's not even going to be of the legal size at all, so make sure you measure. They're going to be silver, pinks, king salmon. Uh, there's going to be salmon of all shapes and sizes. And not only that, there's going to be a multitude of other species there too. There's going to be halibut, lingcod, rock cod, and arctic char. You don't want any of those fish though, so throw them out if you catch them. Good luck. And so those two boats steam off to go fishing. In the lookalike example though, Number three, right? What are you telling the captain? Captain, this is exactly what a king salmon looks like. It's this long, this tall, it weighs 45 pounds, puts up a heck of a fight. If you see one, catch one, and oh, by the way, there's no coordinates for you. You can fish in the entire ocean. If you find one of those fish, drop a line and catch it, right? So you think about that analogy and, and that in my mind is how powerful it is. You, you are trusting in Facebook's algorithm with a lookalike audience to go out and find people that look exactly like the kind of people that you want on your site, about to buy, have purchased, have showed signals that, that, are, that are valid. So that's a great way it, to, to, to think about it and why the lookalikes are so powerful, why the lookalikes are pretty much everyone's initial go-to audience. Um, uh, you know, as soon as you have any, any measurable data set. And so, you know, the fact that you can tell Facebook to search their entire advertising platform and network to look for people that look just like your buyers, it's profound. It's why Facebook is just destroying Google in terms of online advertising. They have so much data on everybody. They, they know how to do this, right? Um, so, you know, it, it, it's just, it's an amazing, amazing concept, okay? That's the lookalike audience, and, and, and it sounds like they're the way to go, right? So how do most people use them? And then, and then let me set that up first, and then let me pivot to the LTV, which is really the subject of this podcast. And so what most people do, we'll stick with the landscape photographer example, they have a website, they have the Facebook pixel installed. When people purchase on the website, the Facebook pixel registers it as a purchase conversion. You then build an audience of those folks, you then create a lookalike audience of those folks. You say, Facebook, use your data, use your magic, use your sorcery and your algorithm. Go and find me people that look exactly like the people that have already purchased on my site. That's the cold audience. That's the lookalike game. That's what everybody uses. And in and of itself, it is profound and works so incredibly well. So now let's pivot to what this new LTV feature when I say new, I think it's maybe it's a year old, the feature, maybe six months, but it, it, it doesn't get anywhere near the amount of attention that it should, which is, which is why I'm happy to be podcasting about it. Now, again, LTV, lifetime value of your customer. Let me just break that down. If your customer purchases just once, say they spent $100 with you on a piece, then you never saw or heard from them ever again, then their LTV is $100. If you have a collector type customer who has purchased, say, six pieces from you over 10 years, uh, then you sum up the total value of those purchases and their LTV is say, let's just say 10,000. So that is how you would go about creating an LTV audience. You would put in the total values of purchases that these folks made and that's the LTV. Now in our previous example, right, we created a lookalike off of the folks that purchased on our site. So let's contrast that audience with the LTV audience. How do they differ in creation? And with the LTV audience, okay, you're gonna combine all of the data you have from your website, right? Which is the same data that the, the, the initial example would be minus the purchase prices. Um, and so you're gonna export all the orders out of your shopping cart. You're gonna fill out a spreadsheet with the first name, last name, email, everything that we covered in the last episode. And you're gonna include a column that has their LTV value, right? But in addition to that, which makes the LTV so great, you're also gonna to cobble together all of your offline data. So all the pieces that you sold at shows or in person or to a doctor's office or 
um, if you had a gallery operation going on or to family or to friends, everything you have data on. So it's the combination of all of the online data with all of the offline data, the kitchen sink, and then you're gonna go ahead and upload this to Facebook and you're gonna create an audience, right? And so you're gonna create the audience with all that additional data that Facebook not, would have not necessarily had because it's a combination of online and off, okay? And you have the real actual dollar amounts uh, that they've spent with you. And you're gonna say, here's this audience, Facebook, go and find it, go and find, use your algorithm, go and find people that look just like this with these additional data points be in there. And so, you know, that alone should get the gears turning in your head, right? It's just, it's a profound technique. Uh, but in a second, I'm about to level your game up even more. But that's it, right? And, and what's great about it is so many of you have so much data out there. You've been artists, you've been photographers for years and years and years. You've made sales uh, and you do not have this all in a spreadsheet. You've never even thought to put this all together in a spreadsheet. You probably don't even have it organized. You've got some receipts in the attic. Uh, you've got some stuff and files here and there. Some stuff's buried in your email. Some stuff you might have in your e-commerce shopping cart. Or perhaps it's all offline data. It doesn't matter. It's about creating this first initial audience and getting started. Now, let me come with sort of some rapid fire bullet points. The more data, as a general rule of thumb, that you give Facebook, the more Facebook is gonna go to work for you. The more accurate its algorithm is gonna be, and uh, you know it's gonna find you more and more people that look ideally to your customers when you give them that data set. And so when you go about inputting all of this additional information, and especially including the dollar amounts these folks have spent with you, you're giving Facebook a ton more data than it would have had otherwise. In addition, you know, in, in the digital sense, yes, Facebook knows who they are, knows who they purchased, but a lot of times you guys have first name, last name, you have their address, you have their phone number, so that's additional data that would not have been available in um, you know, just a straight digital gathering, gathering way. So that makes it really powerful. Um, and so obviously the more data you give your look like, the more accurate and thus the targeting will have less waste, the whole ball of wax I referenced earlier. Um, you're only gonna be showing your ads to King Salmon to stick on the fishing one. Now, the real question becomes, how much data do you need to make this technique effective? Very good question there. And to be honest, we're not entirely sure just yet. Yes, we have the benchmarks that are out there. Yes, we have what's recommended. Yes, the numbers are supposedly so much better when you get a bigger data set. That's just a, a rule of algorithms in general. The more data you have, the better off they are. But we're testing this now. I've, I've got a number of different customers that are putting their list together, um, and we're gonna get to the bottom of what constitutes the minimum level of data set. And you know, in all of the tests that I've run personally um, and seen a great level of success with, you know, or admittedly 5,000 records and above, right? So it, 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 there's, there's a lot of data there and that probably sounds daunting. You're like, 5,000 records? I don't have 5,000 people that I know, let alone have 5,000 people that have purchased from me or have 5,000 records in general. And I get that, that it, doesn't, that it doesn't apply to most of you out there. Totally get that and that is A-okay. Here's why. You can combine audiences. So your LTV is not big enough yet? Well, it's all good. Combine it with some other audience, throw all that in an ad group and get going. You have to get started somewhere, right? And for many of you, you have way bigger lists than you think you do, especially when you dig into your records and get all of your historical data, all of your historical receipts, all of your offline data, right? So I believe that starting with this exercise now, which so few photographers or artists have ever likely done, is going to pay dividends down the road. Facebook's algorithm seems to be getting better and better each and every day. I mean, that's just fact. I could do things now that I couldn't even come close to doing six months ago. It just keeps getting better, which is amazing. So the point here is that no matter where you are in your journey as a photographer or an artist, you should start making your LTV list. You should be diligent about your customer LTV list, and you should start getting going on it today. I mean, it's, it's literally as simple as a spreadsheet or a Google Doc. You don't need some fancy CRM or database. A spreadsheet will work just fine. If you're super old school, get a piece of graph paper. Uh, somebody's going to have to digitize it at a point, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Now, I have some even more insight and a profound, profound level up that I want to drop on you, and it has big implications. I mean, it's, it's, it, it's just profound. There's no other way to say it. So let me drop it, and then I have even more awesome uh, that I want to wrap things up with and some real-world examples you're probably just not even thinking of. So first, let's get going with the, with the level up. Here it is. You ready? The negative signals are just as important as the positive signals in your LTV list. 
The negative signals you send to Facebook in this list are just as important as the positive signals and even more uh, uh, than the variation in positive signals. What do I mean? So you throw together your entire database list into this spreadsheet. All of the records you have on customers and potential customers, even friends and family. You assign values to everybody that has purchased something and here it is. You assign values to everybody that has not purchased something. If you have a list of say a thousand people, that's what you've been able to put together, everything that you've got. Just to make the math easy, let's say only 150 people on that list have purchased something from you. Or 15, it doesn't matter. Okay, great. You take the values for the 150 and you plug them in. And then you go ahead and you plug in a zero for everybody that's not purchased anything from you. Those are additional data points for Facebook to work with. In many cases, you probably have people on your list that are never going to buy from you. It's a-okay. Tell Facebook who those folks are and include the data to generate your lookalike. The data on those folks is actually potentially almost as valuable as the data on those that purchased uh, one or many pieces from over the years because it, it, it's more data Facebook can use to refine their signal. And, and, and that's just profound, isn't it? Uh, moreover, the data on the people that purchased more than once, uh, the variation in positive signals I referenced, is, is just so incredible. I mean, I, my, my buddy Matthew, he's been on the podcast, I immediately told him to start making this list and you know, he's got one collector that is like his super fan, right? This guy's bought 20 pieces from him, his number one super fan and serious collector. Uh, how powerful is it to be able to put that guy's LTV, his lifetime value into a list and say, go and find me another one like that, right? Like you wanna find another 20 like that, uh, you'll take as many as you can get. So that is essentially how to create the lookalike LTV audience in Facebook with the both positive and negative signals. Um, and that's a super new technique that I don't think a lot of people are talking about. It should, it should hopefully be new to you and, 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 and really get the gears going. So let's discuss um, some real world implications of this and perhaps some examples of, you know, of working this through that I think most people have not thought of and that, and that we've sort of been coming to a conclusion to, you know, as we think about the best way to empower like, you know, our varied customer base and, 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 and you know, the, the best ways to ensure that they're gonna be successful. And let's just start here and say, okay, here's real world example number one. Uh, you're an artist that's been doing the show circuit for years and have made great sales over a long period of years, right? I mean, it could be 10 or 15 or 20 or 30 pieces a year. You did okay in the fairs and you've been doing that forever. Well, go and get those receipts and emails and get them into your LTV list. You probably have gathered quite a few contacts, the people that did not buy over, that, over, over the years, right? Your list is probably way, way bigger than you thought it might be. Again, it doesn't matter if you don't have the email address, first name, last name, phone number, address, and LTV will do. That'll do, that'll, that'll work fantastic. And so there's, there's a way to stitch it together. Real world example number one. Real world example number two. Uh, let's just say that you're a full-time photographer, right? And perhaps the majority of your business is on the service side of things. Perhaps you do weddings or portraits, or let's say uh, you're, my, you're my buddy Mike Taylor, right? He shoots long exposure, nighttime, I guess you would call it spectral photography. Dude's a legend at it. What does his business look like though? The majority, which I think is a bucket a whole lot of photographers in, is running classes at the national parks around the US. So he runs classes where he takes people to a national park for a weekend or you know a week or whatever, and he teaches them how to make these complex exposures. And that's, that's the majority of his business. That's, that's the main pillar of his business. His side business, is selling fine art prints of his work. And while it's growing, it certainly does not constitute the majority of his business. So what's a guy like Mike to do? He takes all of his students' records over the years and he creates one LTV audience. Every single solitary student, that's taken one of his classes. How much they paid for the class, first name, last name, address, all, all, all of the things that we have in the template, right? And he creates an audience of his students. Then he goes in, he grabs his online data and his offline data and he makes a second audience for anyone that's bought fine art prints from him, right? From anyone that is purchased from that particular silo of his business. And when it's time to sell his classes, he's gonna have an LTV audience to show his ads to. When it's time to sell his prints, he's gonna have an LTV audience to show his ads to. So you can split the various different pillars of your business, whatever it might be. I mean, you could be walking dogs on the side, it doesn't even matter. The LTV concept works fantastically for both instances. And I think moreover, there's, there's, there's so many people that I hear this, I hear this all the time from customers, both artists and photographers, like, 
all of my following is just other artists. These people are never going to buy anything. I get that. I get that. So split the list. Split your list. You got an LTV for one. You got an LTV for the other. And in Mike's case, is the perfect example. And I and I think too that, um, excuse me, many many photographers have businesses like this. Many artists do too. So put the LTV concept to work in these other pillars of your business, and you will just be blown away. And yet another reason why you want to get going on it. Now let me give you a real world example number three, and I think. Yeah, this is my favorite one is it applies to all of you equally. And again, I find it to be profound again. Uh, many of you that are listening out there, you're not full-time photographers or artists in terms of selling your work. You have day jobs, side hustles, other ways of making, making income while you would certainly like to be full-time. The math just don't pencil just yet. That's okay, right? Uh, moreover, I would say many of you struggle with this question about your niche. You have work that spans a few different genres, and when the thought of having to pick a niche and go all in, it, it makes your head hurt. How could I possibly do that, right? Do I have to start a separate site, a new name, focus on a direction? Uh, all really, really difficult questions to answer. There's no, there's no easy answer to any of those. Um, the niche question. Uh, you know, let's say you're a full-time wedding photographer and you shot weddings to the last 25 years, but you want to get your fine art career going. And perhaps let's say you've, you've taken up drone photography. You started doing it uh, in all these exotic locations you're going to and beautiful wedding venues uh, to supplement that side of the business. But now you've gotten so good at it that you're really enjoying it and you, you kind of want to start selling your photographs, your drone photography, right? Uh, you want to build out that portfolio. Or let's say you're an artist that paints a mixed bag of different subject materials you have for years and your day job has been teaching kindergarten, let's just say, for the last 20 years or 10 years or whatever. In all of those cases, over the years, um, you have we have cultivated relationships with folks that have come to know, like, and trust you as a person, albeit in a different capacity perhaps than your art, right? Like, you know, your, your wedding clients are not necessarily fine art purchasers. Uh, 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 the, 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 the lady that's teaching kindergarten, all of those parents and potentially students are not likely purchasers of her art, right? But these are people, their attention, and guess what? It's attention that knows, likes, and trusts you. They've come to know and like and trust you as a person, albeit in a different capacity than your art. Guess what though? Attention is attention. Technically, that's all attention that you own. So you can leverage these folks that know, like, and trust you, and you can include them in both your regular audiences and your lookalike audiences. And now, sure, they haven't bought a piece of art, but perhaps they have some empty wall space in the office. They're starting their journey to buy some art, and they're not exactly sure what they want to get yet, right? So it might be a good idea to let them know you have a serious portfolio of art uh, for sale. And guess what? These people love you. They like, they, people like doing business with people they know, like, and trust. That's just, the, that's the long and the short of it. So you can grab all of these folks, whatever contact information you have on them, right? You can, you can call it your fan list and you can upload it to Facebook. You can include LTV info if it's applicable, if it's applicable in the wedding, uh, uh photographer example, you know, those are, those are big deals. Those are big deals. So throw that LTV in there. It's applicable and you can start showing ads to just this audience to start, and if it works, if it pencils, you can create a lookalike out of those folks too. That might just work. That is a great way of getting some like-minded people that know, like, and trust you. So I think this concept of an audience of folks that you know in other capacities is a pretty doggone interesting place to start, and it is certainly where I would start uh, should I start selling my art or my photography. It'd be photography. I couldn't do art to save my life, but I could take photos. So that, I think, is, is a third profound example. And I think, man, it ticks a whole bunch of different boxes. And I know that there are so many people out there that are listening that you know, have these connections and, or, or, or have been cultivating these relationships their entire life, as we all have. And perhaps you have some sort of interesting and nuanced and unique circumstance that is unique to you. And you haven't even thought about it in this capacity, but it's a fantastic way to go. I would absolutely want to let everybody know that knows, likes, and trusts me that my art is for sale. And, oh, God, yeah, that Patrick, he was awesome. He did such a great job at my wedding. I had no idea he does this drone stuff. Oh, this drone stuff's pretty sweet. I can't even believe he got this photo here. This thing would look fantastic in my office. I'm going to buy it. So you, you, you get the gist. It's, it's, it's an interesting argument that not a lot of people are making uh, that, I think, that I think could really work. So... Let me sum things up. There was a lot going on here. Get to work on your LTV audience. Step one, as you're ruminating on the bigger subjects, is to do the organizational work and get everything into the spreadsheet. Gather all that data you have. 
go back as far as you can and start building your spreadsheet, right? This is gonna give you a great starting point to target on Facebook and Instagram, and especially, especially as the fourth quarter approaches, although you'll be able to use this audience throughout the year. Now, in the coming episodes, we're gonna reference exactly how to utilize this audience and targeting and how it's gonna fit into our playbooks, our updated playbooks that we're gonna do for the fourth quarter. And don't worry either, I'm not gonna leave you hanging. Uh, in addition to the spreadsheet that I'm gonna place in the show notes that you can use as a template to get started, I'm also gonna create a video that will walk you through exactly step-by-step what it looks like to take this list that I'm asking you to create, how you upload it to Facebook, how you make sure it all looks good, and then how course, after the fact you, you set up the lookalike audience after the fact. Um, there's some detailed steps in there. The video is gonna walk you through the whole thing. Um, and I'm gonna, gonna put that video on YouTube. Um, we're starting to take uh, both as a podcast and our storefronts as a brand, our YouTube channel way more seriously. Um, and there's a ton of good stuff there already. Uh, so I'm gonna put a link to our YouTube channel in the show notes, or you can just search YouTube for Art Storefronts. Highly recommend you subscribe. Highly recommend you tick the little bell so you get notified when we're doing the live broadcasts. All of the podcast episodes are starting to go up there. All of the supplemental material to the podcast, i.e. this video that I owe you on this podcast, will be up there. You'll be able to watch it. It's just easier if it's on YouTube. You can find it any anytime you want. So. All of that stuff's gonna go up there. So hit that link, subscribe, hit the bell, get notifications when we're going live, and let's get ready to hammer the fourth quarter and sell more art than we ever have this holiday season. Thanks for listening, and have a great day.